Well, for more on the relationship between the U.S. and Canada, I'm joined by Diane Francis. She's an American and Canadian journalist, author, and senior fellow at the Atlantic Council here in Washington. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Now, Diane, according to the U.S. Embassy in Canada, these two countries share nearly $1.5 billion in trade and investment in their relationship. So what are some of the key areas of economic cooperation? Well, I would say that uh, our, our selling of resources, principally oil to the United States, is our number one export. And then there's autos and auto parts. And then there's manufactured goods, electronics. And then there's a cross-border tourism business on both sides of the border. That's very important to each economy. Uh, and agricultural exports are also critical, along with forestry products. Now, you did lead off with oil, and Obama and Trudeau are also building on their environmental goals, promising to lead the world into a low-carbon economy. So with that being said, what does that mean for their energy sectors and, in turn, their economies? Well, it's not very good news for the energy sectors in either country, to be honest. Uh, however much we may be sympathetic with climate change issues. And the other thing, too, to remember is that they may have come to some agreement today in Washington and made a big splash announcement. But Mr. Trudeau has yet to convince some of the provinces to go ahead with his carbon tax and other measures that he pledged out of Paris, the, the climate change talks. And Obama's going to have a very difficult time, as a lame duck president, getting anything through Congress. So these are intentions. These are not necessarily platforms that are going to be enacted immediately. And speaking of some of the difficulties, that close relationship can come with its problems. You have former Prime Minister Lester Pearson, who described Canada's relationship with the U.S. like living with a wife. He said, at times, it's difficult to live with her. At all times, it's impossible to live without her. So when it comes to some of these difficulties, especially in the economic relationship, what would you say are the real standouts? Well, I think that uh, the, the you said, what was the standout problem, or...? Yes, what are the, the main issues of, uh, of contention between the two countries when it comes to their economy? Well, in, the, in terms of the economy, it's just the fact that we do rub against each other so much. I mean, we're selling an awful lot of stuff to them and vice versa. We're one another's largest trading partners, respectively, that there's bound to be trade irritants. So, for instance, the, the milk producers, the dairy guys, the guys who do chickens in the U.S. resent the fact that they, they're not allowed to sell their stuff in Canada. The Canadians are upset because sometimes the beef is not allowed to be sold and softwood lumber is not allowed to be sold. There's also a dispute over lobster. There's a dispute over oil and gas properties way up in the north near Alaska and the Canadian border who owns the offshore oil. So there's all these kinds of things. But, you know, considering the scale of magnitude of the relationship economically, this is pretty picky owned stuff. We no. get along pretty well. Where, where the problems do really arise, Rachel, is, is in the, the diplomatic files, in the foreign relations files. And so, you know, it's been almost 20 years since the uh, President of the United States has thrown a state dinner for a Canadian Prime Minister, almost 20 years. And so this has been because Canada did not participate in the Iraq invasion, and there was very frosty relations with the Bush regime. And then also the Keystone Pipeline delays and eventual rejection have caused a lot of frosty relationships during the Obama regime. Now, something so that now that something that's passed us, they're, they're kissing and making up. Now, Dan, as you say that, another area of controversy on top of the ones that you mentioned is also what's on track to be the biggest trade pact in history, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP. Now, how do Canadians view this deal? Well, initially, both regimes, the previous prime minister and the current uh, lame duck president, uh, said that they were in favor of it. But, you know, again, they have to face legislatures. The new prime minister is taking a look at it, but I think that both countries are disinclined to sign on to it. All right. Um, and just quickly, um, as we look at the commodity prices and how that's affected Canada's economy, do you think that's still going to continue to be an issue? It is a very good question, and it is the problem. We are in a recession, and we're going to stay in a recession, I think, for quite a while unless and until the commodity prices turn around. Agriculture is doing well, oil and gas is a disaster, and our currency has gone down almost 30% as a result, directly of the fact oil prices have tracked down. So it's, it's an ongoing issue. On the other hand, it does make us a cheaper place to have a vacation, and it makes us a cheaper place to manufacture things. So, but on balance, it's not good.
Well, depending on how the elections turn out, there may be a, a lot more people coming to Canada. Thanks again, Diane Francis, Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council. All right, just ahead on the show, mixed messages. The European Central Bank gives and takes away investors' hopes in one go. Find out why its latest stimulus moves are anything but. That's next.